Uh, good morning and welcome to the 2023 Iowa Ideas Conference. I'm Dusky Terry, president of ITC Midwest, and we're excited to once again be the presenting sponsor for this great conference. As an Iowa-based company with headquarters in Cedar Rapids and employees across the state, ITC Midwest embraces the mission of Iowa Ideas and sees value in being part of the conversation about the future of Iowa. Whether you're joining today to offer your expertise in a particular area, engage in the discussion of an emerging issue, or learn something new, there's a topic for everyone. Please explore the various tracks and the sessions within each track, and then lend, lend your voice to the conversations taking place today and tomorrow. Open your mind to different points of view as we all work together to come up with the best solutions for making Iowa an even better place now and in the future. You know, we often talk here at ITC Midwest about the power of connection, meaning electrical connections are needed to deliver power to communities. There's also tremendous power when people connect to solve problems. Thank you for joining us here today to help shape the future and enjoy the conference. Good morning and welcome to Iowa Ideas 2023. I'm Zach Kacharski. I'm the executive editor of the Gazette. This year, the Gazette's celebrating 140 years covering Eastern Iowa as an independent news organization. On behalf of the employee owners of the Gazette, we want to welcome the over 1,400 attendees tuning in to our signature statewide event. Over the next two days, access to more than 200 speakers and 60 sessions across 10 tracks. This is made possible due to the months of planning led by the Gazette team and the expertise of our advisory council members. We thank them for their participation throughout the year to help make this a reality. Our virtual conference is put together on the Whova event platform, which makes connecting and exchanging ideas a great experience. We've got the attendee directory, the community boards, and you'll want to get familiarize yourself with the chat and the Q&A options uh, because that's how you can ask questions throughout the sessions. We'll also use the speed networking function uh, later today. Access to all is an important uh, priority when it comes to Iowa Ideas. This continues to be a free event, thanks to the conference sponsors. We just heard from our presenting sponsor, ITC Midwest, who's been with us since year one. Along with track sponsors, UFG Insurance, ACT, Inclusive ICR, our content sponsors, Van Meter, Cedar Rapids Bank and Trust, and the Cedar Rapids Metro Economic Alliance, and a number of community partners that you'll hear from and see throughout our time together. Another major sponsor of 2023 is our keynote sponsor, Kirkwood Community College, who've made it possible for this year's incredible lineup of uh, keynote speakers. Now, a message from Kirkwood. Hello, and welcome to the Iowa Ideas Conference. I'm Lori Sundberg, and I'm the president of Kirkwood Community College, and we are proud to be a sponsor of this year's conference. The Iowa Ideas Conference brings educational sessions on a variety of topics to Iowans from across the state. It is a fantastic conference and we are proud to be a part of it. From all of us at Kirkwood Community College to all of you, I hope you enjoy the conference this year. And once again, welcome. And now it's time to introduce our morning keynote, our opening keynote. We don't quite have the same hype reels at Iowa Idea as they do at uh, Carver Hawkeye Arena, but we're extremely excited to welcome uh, Coach Lisa Bluter and Associate Coach Jan Jensen to Iowa Ideas. Coach Bluter is in her 24th year as the P. Sue Beckwith head women's basketball coach. The position was endowed in 2021 by P. Sue Beckwith, one of the UI Athletics' most generous supporters. As the all-time winningest coach in program history, the Hawkeyes have advanced to 21 postseason appearances in 23 seasons, including the NCAA tournament berths in the 13 of the last 15 seasons. Uh, Coach Bluter is among the dean, well, she is the dean among the Big Ten women's coaches and has many individual accolades. Student athletes have been named Academic All Big Ten 136 times, including a program best 11 honorees in 2023. Bluter is a Marion native and graduate of Linmar and played basketball at UNI. She began coaching at St. Ambrose in the Quad Cities before moving to Drake for 10 seasons. At Drake, Bluter coached Jan Jensen. During Jensen's senior year, she led the nation in scoring with 29.6 points per game and was the Gateway Conference most valuable player. Jensen graduated from Drake in 1991 with a degree in public relations. She earned her master's in higher education five years later. After college, Jensen played professionally in the European Professional Basketball League in Germany. Jensen returned stateside and began working as an assistant to Coach Bluter at Drake. Jensen also served as Coach Bluter's first assistant coach and re uh, recruiting coordinator there. 
Jensen's in her, also in her 24th season with the Iowa women's basketball team and her 20th as an associate head coach. She's a nationally known presence on the recruiting scene and is the recruiting coordinator and works with the post players in the Hawkeye program. She's recruited four McDonald's All-Americans to play at Iowa, and she's in her 35th season in women's college basketball player, either as a player or a coach. Jensen's a native of Kimbleton, Iowa, over in Audubon County, uh, and is one of the few players who led the nation in scoring in both high school, where she averaged only 66 points per game, and at a Division I university. We're truly excited to welcome both of you to Iowa Ideas. Thank you, Zach. We're excited to join you at this prestigious conference this morning and anxious for a, a really fun discussion. And we appreciate the opportunity to be here, Zach. So thank you and, and congratulations to the Gazette for doing this for so many years. Well, and thank you. Uh, we're kind of joining together in a, in a kind of a truly unique time in program history. And I'm curious, uh, you know, you, you've had a stretch where you competed for the national championship. You've had throngs of fans celebrating the team. You have a sold out season coming up at home. Uh, and the level of attention is unlike anything that, w that we've had before. And you, you have to turn the page and kind of start again. I, I'm curious, you know, have you had much of an off season? Have you had a chance to take it in? What is it like uh, right now in the program? You know, it was a whirlwind. I'll, I'll tell you that. It was an incredible whirlwind, partly because our season went so long and our fans have been so terrific um, in welcoming us home and then celebrating uh, with us the accomplishments of last season. And of course, Caitlin Clark, you know, she won about every award that you could possibly win in women's basketball. And so traveling around with her to those, um, you know, the award ceremonies. And then, of course, we had our foreign trip as well this year. And so we were lucky enough to be able to take our team to southern Italy and Croatia. Um, so, yes, it's been a little bit of a whirlwind. Um, I don't know that I'm ready to turn the page, but with time to turn the page. Coach Jensen, how, how has it been for you? You know, I think really similarly, obviously, Lisa and I are almost like family. <laughs> you know, our lives are so intertwined personally and professionally. Uh, but the the pace has been um, unlike any other year, obviously. Um, and we're so grateful for that. Because what made that run so special last year was that so many people were vested and truly cared. And that, I think aside from everything else that happened was always seeing all these throngs of people, you know, throughout the run, making it to the final four, coming home. Um, it was, it was just really heartwarming. And so then giving back when we've come back, um, whether we've been asked to speak or just people grabbing you in target, right. Um, or just wanting to be a part of, uh, you know, our season, you know, with everything that's upcoming, it was really heartwarming. So if you, you get a little bit tired, um, it's always overtaken by, by gratitude because uh, it, the fans, you talk about our recruiting, everybody in this fan base is what's helped our recruiting. So, you know, everything continues to roll. So you get lots of coffee and uh, you, you keep your, you know, your, yourself going. So it's been a blast and we're just excited to keep trying to do it over and over again. Do you feel pressure uh, to do that? Or is that, you know, does the gratitude kind of ease that too? Yeah. I mean, I think it does for, you know, it, there is pressure because you don't want to not perform, but our whole lives, we never wanted to perform, right? Whether you're at the top or in the middle or you're trying to rebuild. And I think Lisa does a really great job of, of leading that. And Lisa, I know you can speak to that and kind of what our, you know, mantra is to start this year. Yeah, I've talked a lot about, you know, pressure is a privilege. And I stole that from Billie Jean King, who happened to be at the final four as well. Um, and, you know, it, it, it is pressure. Like right now we're ranked six in the country. We're picked to finish number one in the Big Ten, which I don't understand because Ohio State's ranked fourth in the country. <laughs> But we'll take it, you know, and, and I tell my players all the time, like, this is an opportunity, you know, you've worked hard to achieve this, let's enjoy it. Um, let's not worry about the consequences of not leaving, you know, living up to people's expectations, let's just do the best that we can to live up to our expectations, and enjoy the opportunity that we have to be on a, 
on a national stage and that we have worked hard to get here. So now that we're here, let's go ahead and enjoy it and not worry about it. Well, you say that it takes decades of work. I mean, you've had kind of the unusual privilege to work together for a few decades now. And I'm curious how you've blended leadership styles. Um, and, you know, you talk about almost like family. Um, but but what does that look like? Um, how do you blend and how do you set goals and how do you work together so tightly? Well, I'll start with that. Um, there's also a third, a third amigo here, and that's Jenny Fitzgerald, who's also been with us for the same amount of time. Um, so Jenny is, is one of our assistant coaches as well. And the three of us, um, you know, got together at Drake and we had some really good success at Drake, uh, including being the state champions together. And so when we had the opportunity to come here to Iowa, you know, I obviously asked Jan and Jenny to come with me because I knew we had a winning combination. And uh, I'm fortunate enough that they both have decided to join me for this long journey and you know, Jan in particular has had lots of head coaching opportunities where she could have been a head coach at many different places. But we all said when we came here, we wanted, we wanted two things. We wanted to go to a Final Four together. We've accomplished that now. And we also wanted to fill Carver Hawkeye Arena. And now we've been able to do that. Um, I think our leadership styles really are different, which is, I think, very good because, you know, different um, leadership styles attract different people. And, and, you know, something that may work for a player for me, you know, may not work for somebody else. And so I think having different personalities, um, different interests also is a good thing because that kind of diversifies our team a little bit more as far as our leadership styles. I've always believed as a leader, you hire people that cover up your weaknesses. We all have weaknesses. And I think identifying your strengths and weaknesses are really important. And so I want to hire people that make up for my weaknesses. And, and I think I've done that with Jan and Jenny. Yeah. And I, I think um, the, you know, Lisa as a leader, if you take that out of it is fantastic, obviously her track record. Um, I think the reason if there's nothing else, if you don't want to judge her on uh, wins and losses and final fours and big 10 championships is I think when you retain staff for this long, and I know that's going to sound a little self-serving because I'm part of that staff, but I think everybody listening, uh, you think of leaders that you've had that you were so ready to hit the door and leave because their values did not align with yours or um, their way of treating people did not align with yours, their motivation, everything, but you were, it was part of your, part of your ascent, right? Um, so to, for me to be a young player, with Lisa coached me, I got to see her as a young, a young person in the locker room um, and how she led. And that was impressive to me. And then when I came back and she took a chance on this young coach and a lot of things happened that, you know, I, it was very serendipitous that I got to be a full-time assistant when most people had to be a GA, a graduate assistant, kind of, you know, you know, work your way up. So that's been great for her because if you if you are a leader watching this to kind of have your right hand and your left hand stay all those years but we wouldn't have stayed if lisa wouldn't have been terrific right in how she viewed things and how she did things um and i think that to me is what i'm most grateful for and i also think it's important for those people who are maybe in a position like myself out there a longtime member of a staff you're not sitting in the corner office um, but what does that look like to help the person in the corner office is I think with leadership styles, you have to be confident in who I am and I'm very confident in who she is, but the whole, you know, uh, quote unquote, yes, person or yes, man, yes, woman, you know, I ain't that right there. You know, there are times, sometimes you go into the office and you're like, this is what I think. And for good or the bad is she hears what I say. Sometimes she accepts that. Sometimes she doesn't. But I think that's the thing that makes a long-term relationship work is when you can have a voice, the voice is heard, and you can also accept when, you know, what you share isn't accepted. But when there's that true um, trust, when there's that belief in each other and that confidence in each other, um, you can have a really long, 
long run as a as a staff. And um, I value that with Lisa. She's not a micromanager. Uh, she has the utmost confidence in Jenny and myself and our whole staff. Uh, but I think that's how you keep people on staff is you let them have a, a, a voice and uh, you don't look over their, their shoulder. And I'm, I'm grateful for that. Coach Bluter, I've seen kind of the, the story, um, you know, applying for that first head coaching gig, um, you know, where you answered, I think it was a want ad in the newspaper. Uh -huh. um, you know, you weren't, you know, applying online at that point. Um, but I, I'm kind of curious, what was that first gig like? How did you approach that? How did you, you know, what was your desire to learn? You know, nobody would ever get a uh, job the way that I did, a, a, a women's basketball coaching job the way I did. It was truly out of the classifieds. Um, you know, I was my first job was at St. Ambrose in Davenport, Iowa, and it was 1984. And so uh, there was no Internet. You're right. Um, that was the way that people really looked for jobs. And so um, my uh, fiance lived in Davenport and I was getting ready to move there after we got married. And uh, uh, his next door neighbor saw this ad in the want ads and called me up and he called me. I, I got my old uh, uh, typewriter out, did some hunting and pecking on that thing and sent off my resume. <laughs> so I was very fortunate um, to get that. But yeah, as, as a person without a lot of experience starting out, um, I really had to go to, I had to learn. Uh, and when you're at that level, you do everything. Like you are like driving the vans, filling them up with gas when you get home, washing the uniforms. You know, you did a little bit of everything. And so it really gave me an opportunity to learn all the skills. And I think that, that helps me today because I appreciate the people that do those things now um, that I don't have to do them anymore. Uh, so I'm glad I had the opportunity to do them. Um, but I certainly had to go and, and, and do a lot of learning. And I, and you know, one of the things I did was I read as many books as I could, watched as many videos as I could on coaching or on leadership. Um, I would go watch practices. Eldon Miller was at UNI at the time. Um, Vivian Stringer uh, was coming to Iowa. And I would go and meet with those people and talk to them. And so having that person to mentor, uh, I think, was crucial in me learning, um, as well as probably making a lot of mistakes along the way and learning from my mistakes. What gave you the confidence to kind of build those mentorships and reach out and make those connections? You know, like kind of dive in, uh, you know, what's the worst thing they can tell me is no, you know, and um, like with coach Stringer, I started out by working her camps here. Uh, and so it was kind of something, you know, a lowly level, you know, I was working with a lot of high school coaches and I was learning from them too, because a lot of them were veteran high school coaches. Um, I was establishing those relationships, but really it was more like, you know, ask, right? I mean, the worst thing they can tell me is no, and I'm no worse off if I get the word no. So uh, proceed till apprehended a lot of times. Coach Jensen, I, I think you met Coach Bluter as a senior at Drake. And I'm curious, when did it click in? Uh, I, and I, I read accounts that you weren't all that thrilled uh, to have a new coach <laughs> senior year. Uh, no. and I and, and I'm curious what that was like. And, and when did you start to build this trust um, that and when did you get a sense that, hey, there's something deeper here? Um, yeah. Well, I. Um, when she came in as a coach, any, you know, anytime you're there for three years, so your senior year, the person who recruited you who kind of knows what you do when they leave and you have this new one coming in, there's that fear that they're going to, you know, kind of like, I suppose, taking a over a company, right? For a while, you're nice to the VPs and, you know, GMs, but then you replace them with your own typically. Um, so you're wondering as a senior, like, oh gosh, is she just going to start and rebuild with her, the youth? Uh, but when she came in, she had a really cool leadership style. We liked her, but we were uncertain, um, you know, exactly what was going to happen. And anytime you rebuild, there's usually not, you know, some losing because you have to, you have to learn a new system. But a, a key moment, we were in Hawaii and for our Thanksgiving trip, and we were conditioned with the coach I'd previously had. If it didn't go well, it didn't matter where you were. It could be Hawaii or it could be, you know, Granger, Iowa. You were seeing the inside of the hotel and the VCR tape over and over and over what you did wrong. Neither wrong nor right. I mean, I was, that's all I learned. Well, Lisa came. We, um 
did not perform well in Hawaii. Our first game, we played um, a final four team and got beat by probably 30. So as a team, we're in the locker room and we're not talking because you're embarrassed, but you're also a kid thinking like, we are never going to, we're not going to see anything in Hawaii. You know, you're just thinking like, we are just, uh, it's going to be terrible. And Lisa came in and gave a riveting speech, very intense at what we did not do well. But what I learned at that moment was a different leadership style and how to coach. Because after that hard nose, bam, 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 she said, you have 15 minutes to shower. We're going to eat at the Hard Rack Cafe and we're going to hit the beach and we're going to watch film tonight. Get your heads right. And she walked out. And at that moment, there was huge celebration and everybody's like, oh my gosh, we love her. Oh my, you know, like, is this happening? And from that point, the whole team shifted and we had a really successful year. Like I had had some success as an individual my whole career, but the response to that leadership as small and trite as that might, that may sound, the whole mentality shifted, the balance, you know, the, the, the fun, uh, the scolding, the pushing. And I think that's translated over all the years on you know how she can you know we build the team our culture and I think it also transcends into work-life balance and um, when I was a young coach I remember um, when you go out and recruit like there's games that start at 8 a.m the last game start at 10 o'clock at night and you really there's no built-in lunch anything so as you're young you're just going and you're trying to take it all in and you're still exhausted even when you're as old as we are now but she taught me in like the second year at that very first summer recruiting, she's like, listen, she's like, you work smart. That's what you do. She, you don't, you don't work. You don't sit at a 10 o'clock game. If there's nobody there, she said, a lot of these young coaches, they sit there because they want everybody to see oh, how hard they're working. She's like, that's dumb if there's nobody there. And I think that's what makes her, you know, what made her really, really good is she's smart. And she's fun, but she's going to kick your new, you know what, when you need it. And that goes as players and it goes as staff, you know, she holds everybody accountable, but there's always a lot in your bucket to handle it all. I appreciate those insights. I, I'm curious, mm -hmm. the, the positivity though, you guys always have a confidence and a positivity um, and coach Blurter, you've talked a lot about parenting, helping coaching. I, I'm curious, you know, how you approach those relationships with players and, and the, the positivity and th that accountability, how do you balance that? Um, because they're not your family members when they get there. Um, yeah. Well, um, I do think I became a better coach when I became a mom. I, I do. I think it taught me patience. Um, it, it taught me that, listen, this is somebody else's child that you are, trying to, you know, grow. Um, and so I think I have evolved over time as a coach. Um, and part of that is you had to because the kids are different now than they were 30 years ago. And part of it is that I understand now that relationships are so important in having success and, you know, building that relationship. And, and I end up really in this time when they're here at Iowa, I probably do spend more time with my players than I do with my own children. And so they do become very close and, and you wanna have those great relationships. If you don't have the relationship, it just isn't as meaningful. I've always said that I don't wanna you know, win a championship and run around and find out I don't have anybody to hug. I wanna be able to hug those people. And last year, I mean, that was so true. You know, My family was there, I was able to hug my family after we made it to the final four, uh, but certainly in the locker room, because we cared for each other so much, it made it so much more rewarding. And although we would have loved to have won the national championship, no doubt, um, you know, we took great pride in finishing second in the United States. And it was more, it was tears, not of um, sadness that we lost. It was tears that when it was over, that that time with that particular team, that ride was over. Um, that's where our tears came from last year at the end of the year. And so I, I really is about relationships to me. It's about caring for each other, uh, building those relationships. And um, that's what makes it special in, in my mind. And I, I think we're also, you know, we're all 
our staff, we're all women of faith and, and having that joy, I think, is something that we really believe in. It's something that we that we try to embrace all the time because we know that, you know, we get the opportunity to impact these women and maybe impact other people that are watching our game and that we want to do that joyfully. Coach Jensen, you travel around, uh, you know, recruiting uh, players. And I'm, I'm curious, how do you go about, you know, a identifying kids that there's student, you know, young women that you think can fit the program, but, but also building that connection with them uh, because you're, you're competing for, you know, time and attention. They have options. Yeah. I mean, it's uh, really an inexact science, right? Um, all of you people, if you have a lead, go ahead and shoot me, shoot me an email. <laughs> but, you know, I say that tongue in cheek. Sometimes it can be as simple as that. Someone in rural Iowa says, hey, there's this seventh grader that looks to be pretty good. And nine times out of 10, they're not, you know, great. But you pursue the lead because you don't know, right? But every now and then it's like, wow, you may not, you don't ever, wouldn't have seen this kid because she's small town Iowa. So that can happen. But there's large tournaments all during the summer. And then we, there's also weekend, uh, April, May, in June, they have long weekends where uh, these organizations put on tournaments where there are thousands of players. So you go and you have like, you make like kind of your matrix and you have, um, uh, you know, some, there's ranking systems that will tell you who some of the higher ranked teams are. So you start that way. Um, and we usually start in junior high. Uh, it you didn't used to be that way. Uh, you were really able to make some, you know, start making decisions sophomore, junior years, even junior years when we first started, I'd say, Lisa. Um, but now uh, junior high is, it gets younger and younger. I don't know if that's always best. Um, but once you start to um, either have them call you, we can't call them until they're um, a junior. So a lot of times you have to, you have to have a handler, whether that's a coach or a club coach, and you are in contact with those people who can get the recruit to call you. And that's where I think the rubber hits the road is you, you, when they're younger, you're just trying to build a relationship and you're noting maturity and you're noting, you know, kind of uh, who has influenced them and if it's positive or negative. And then regardless is um, how will that fit into your, your team? And what Lisa and I have always said is, um, you know, if you build, if you really pared down what we're about in recruiting, if we came up with this a few years ago, and the sentence is, we recruit great young women who happen to be great basketball players. And we never, ever compromise that order. And I think that's the, that's the ticket is um, we've had a lot of people come into our office and, you know, when they get to that point, it gets a little more serious, but um, man, if they don't, if they don't really gel with us and, you know, the questions that are being asked or, um, and that goes with the whole family, not just the recruit. Um, if everybody's not kind of on board with our, our um, mission, then we'll, we'll, we'll move on. And sometimes people don't do that. You know, they're just going to take the great player. It doesn't matter all the other stuff, but for us, it really does become a family and we want them to be great young women. So um, there's just, you know, different things we look for. When we were younger, if we saw, um, you know, red flags, I was anyway, I'm like, oh, you know, I think we can change that. Now, if the flag is even remotely pink, uh, -uh moving on. <laughs> it's just like, it's hard to change some of those, those, those values or uh, whatever you have it, personality traits. So that's what we're about. And we work really hard to invite young women that are, that are great greatest people first. One of the questions that we have is how do you coach and manage the team with so much attention getting paid to some of the players and not necessarily all of them? How do you, you know, kind of keep that dynamic? Um, how, how does that work behind the scenes? Yeah. You know, I think, you know, everybody's probably referring to Caitlin Clark, um, you know, and that she gets so much more attention on our team. She's the star uh, versus, you know, our other players. 
Um, we were fortunate that we actually dealt with a star before this, and Megan Gustafson in 2019 was the national player of the year as well. Um, since we've gotten more media attention and stuff, I think now people are just understanding women's basketball a little bit better, and there's more eyes upon us. So when you're dealing with somebody that is a star, and everybody has a star performer in their office, right? I mean, you know, they are going to probably get a little bit more because they are the star performer, the star producer. So Caitlin does have more NIL opportunities, name, image, and likeness opportunities than the other members of our team. She also, um, you know, has more attention, more media attention. Um, you know, sometimes that can be good. Sometimes that can be bad. But I think how we keep the locker room even, how we keep it um, not jealous, and I'm talking about 14, 20-year-old women, you know, jealousy is a kind of a big thing. Um, so how do we make it that this is a team sport and not just a single person sport? First of all, we work with Caitlin a lot and we make her understand that she's got to be the best teammate possible and that she's got to bring her team along with her. She's got to encourage them. She's got to motivate them. Um, and, and she also understands like she's got to be the hardest worker on the team. So she's got to be at practice first. She's got to be the last one to leave. And when you're a great teammate like that, and when they see you putting in the, the time and when you're being kind to others, there's not as many jealousies. They know she deserves it. They know that she's special and that she has earned it. Um, you know, what we hope is that she raises the bar so that everybody starts working as hard as she does. Everybody is, is a great a teammate as she is, because then that raises the whole team level. Um, we've also said to her, listen, our, we've said to our team, listen, when Caitlin's light shines, it shines on all of us. It's making all of us better. It's bringing more to all of us. And I think they understand that. So yeah, there is a star performer on our team, but she realizes she can't do what she wants to do without the rest of them. And I think that she's such a good example of, you know, I'm working the hardest. So yes, you know, I might be, I might be getting a little bit more in this day and age of, name, image, and likeness, but I don't think anybody begrudges it because sometimes that brings upon added responsibilities that they don't want. For example, Caitlin really can't go to the mall. She can't do that now. Um, she, you know, she has to be on her P's and Q's all of the time. And so there are some things like the other kids, like, I don't want to do all those press conferences that she has to do. So there are some things that she has to do that they don't even want to do. Uh, and I think that helps as well. I'm curious um, how NIL, you mentioned it, Coach Bluter, has, has changed. If if you're going at some of those personalities, uh, do you feel like you're having to recruit the team to stay? Do you feel like you've had enough time to um, to feel that uh, yet? Or you know, how has NIL you know changed how you approach leading a team? Yeah, name, image, and likeness is something that a few years back, I was like, no, no way. I was not, you know, I didn't buy in. Um, I thought, oh, they're getting a scholarship. They're getting their books. They're getting their fees paid for. They don't need anything other than that as a collegiate athlete. My tune has totally changed on that. I feel like why should they not be able to use their name, image, and likeness to make money? Um, why should they not be able to? Every, all the rest of America can you do that. So why should our athletes not be able to do that? So, yeah, I definitely had a shift, and I also now see the benefits of name, image, and likeness. I see our women promoting themselves. I see our women branding themselves and having an opportunity to learn about contracts and fulfilling those contracts. And, you know, um, really, it's a, it's a business lesson that they are getting every single day on how to market themselves. Um, they can't learn that by sitting in a classroom over in the Tippy School of Business or by reading about it in a, in a textbook. They're getting real life experiences um, in these situations. So to me, they're entrepreneurs, um, as long as it does not take away from their athletics and, and their academics, I am all for it. I think it's been a great opportunity. And, you know, again, the more publicity Caitlin gets, through all of her name, image, and likeness, the more awareness it brings to our team, the more awareness it brings to the University of Iowa. So I think it's it's really been a good thing. Um, Zach, what you might be talking about is a transfer portal. You know, that's a different that's a different element that we've also had to start working with now is knowing that kids can go in the transfer portal at in you know at the end of the year and not be obligated to stay there four years. Um, and that's been different. So now 
you have to kind of keep recruiting your own players and make sure they're having a good um, experience so they don't want to jump into that transfer portal. Do you have to worry about that much? Or if you work on the culture, are you confident that, you know, it's that the team will want to stay together? In my opinion, um, you know, if you don't want to be a part of our team, I don't really want you to be a part of our team. And so I don't mind the transfer portal either. I think, um, unfortunately, I think kids um, are being taught a lesson that if I don't like something, I just jump ship and it's always the grass is always greener on the other side of the fence. And they always they find out maybe it wasn't so bad where I was. Maybe the grass wasn't greener. So I think that's the bad part is it doesn't teach that you know, young women or young men, let's stick to something. I made a promise. Let's stick to it and let's try to make it work. Um, on the other hand, we don't have a lot of people entering into the transfer portal out of our program because they are having a good experience because we do have a good culture. But if it's like all they're interested in is playing time and they're not getting playing time, they probably, you know, okay, enter the transfer portal and see if you can get playing time somewhere else. I, they only get four years of eligibility. And if that is their driving factor, you know, maybe it is something if they can see the writing on the wall that I'm not going to be able to get more playing time here, that they should be able to leave. Um, so there's pros and cons. Uh, again, we haven't lost a lot of people in the transfer portal. And I think a lot of it is because of the environment we have here at the University of Iowa is so good that people want to be a part of it. Um, maybe even if they're not getting the minutes they, they think they deserve. I wanted to jump a little bit now. Uh, the fight for equality for women's athletics is something that's been uh, extremely important to each of you. Uh, and and both of you came and had an opportunity to work with Dr. Christine Grant, uh, who was far ahead, um, you know, one of the the, the true uh, leaders uh, and the staunchest advocates for equality. I'm curious, how do you feel that you, both the university and college athletics are doing, uh, and what would you like to see? Uh, and, and do you start to see progress evolving at the pro level? What, what would you like to see? Dan, do you want me to go first? Or you want to go first? Um, oh, I'm, I, I'll take it and you can follow up. Um, you know, I think there's been so much progress that has been made. Um, when I think back, what Lisa shared, you know, she drove the bus and she mopped the floor. Um, but there's, you know, still so many hurdles and so far left to go. I think there's always a danger in, oh, wow, they've made it, right? And I think that um, there's still, in, if you look at the leadership positions, there's still, you know, not a lot of female athletic directors. We love our interim right now, Beth Getz. Um, we're every coach here at the University of Iowa. I think Lisa said it at our Big Ten press conference or the media is that, everybody's united here with that. So we're thrilled with her, but you know, it's a patriarchal society and that's no one's fault. That's just how it has always been. But there's with that, there is a lot of times, not as much support, not as much interest um, in women. So for us to be at a point in time where we've sold out our arena, um, we have the crossover event happening at Kinnick to have the people last year, just latch onto our team and be part of us is just a moment in time. And I don't know if Lisa, myself, Jenny, or anybody in our staff can fully articulate what it feels like. We've been at the beginning where there hasn't been a whole lot of people. We have talked to a lot of Rotary clubs and, and sold tickets. We've gone door to door uh, back at Drake to sell tickets to try to get people in, invested. So um, I don't know if it's more pro sports, um, I think that's a definitely a start. We're talking the Women's National Basketball Association, more franchises. I think it all continues to start at the grassroots level is when we have opportunities that are equal for young girls and young boys, and we're funding it continually the same, supporting it. So when these young girls grow up, there are equal opportunities. And when we support it at the young levels, then when we get to colleges, I mean, it's, you know, the University of Nebraska had an event outside. They played volleyball outside in, I believe, uh, September. You know, they sold out their football stadium. It is happening. It will happen when people really invest in it. And I think it just has to start at the, 
the ground level and it has to start with, I think, a lot of like-minded companies um, that are, are willing to uh, make sure that um, they're, they're welcoming women at those leadership positions and not just checking a box. There's no doubt that Title IX has helped women's athletics immensely. Um, you know, I've seen the growth. I was a Title IX baby. And so I was one of the first ones that got a half a scholarship uh, to play basketball. And, um, you know, I went from, you know, coaching and, and playing in front of 500 people to now coaching in front of 50,000 people this weekend. So it is definitely, the growth has been amazing. I think we have to keep reminding our young people of where we have come from. Uh, so that they can continue to understand they have to continue to fight for equality and that it's not just going to be given to you, that it is a fight continuously. I I'm fortunate that I was hired by Dr. Grant, uh, but unfortunately, she retired after six months uh, when I was on the job. The good thing is she went from being a boss to a mentor to, to me, and I was able to pick her brain for about 20 years before she passed away. And um, I still have in my desk a picture of Dr. Grant and myself together um, because she is a constant motivation, a constant reminder for me to continue to be persistent, to continue to keep my eyes and ears open, to make sure that we are getting the equality that we so richly deserve. So, um, it, you know, gender equity isn't exactly where it, has, where it should be across the country. But I think at Iowa, because of the work of Dr. Grant, because of the people of Iowa, you know, we've had basketball in the state since 1920 for girls. It's so unusual uh, from other states around the, around the nation. So we're lucky we live in a state that supports women's athletics. Uh, I think the media has been amazing. I think it's because of the media that we've made the growth that we have um, the last several years, because now all of a sudden we were on television. We were front page news. We were in the newscast because of that. People have been exposed to what this product is, and they're realizing, oh, these women do play an exciting style. They are talented athletes. I do enjoy watching them. They're good entertainment. But also, I think because Title IX has been around now for 50 years, some of the women that were Title IX babies like me have children that are having children, and they are more supportive because they understand the benefits that they have been receiving from athletics. And so they are now, these are women that are having children, women that grew up playing sports and understand the value. So they're encouraging their young women to participate and they're encouraging their boys to support those women as well. I'm curious, uh, you've both kind of mentioned players have changed through the years. Mm -hmm. How do you keep yourself young? How do you, uh, you know, become relevant, not the, you know, I, I have two daughters and dad jokes. They roll their eyes and, oh, that's dad <laughs> jokes. Uh, what keeps you young and the, how do you do that? You know, um, I think the players keep me young. You know, being around young people all the time helps me to stay young. Um, obviously, we're pretty active. You know, we exercise. We try to eat well and take care of ourselves and those type of things. But, you know, being around young, positive women it helps, right? You know, it's, it's who, who do you surround yourself with? If you surround yourself with a bunch of cranky people, you're probably going to be cranky. If you surround yourself with good people that have your same vision and your same goals and your same beliefs, you, you know, that are optimistic, you're going to be optimistic. Uh, but don't ask me about the, the artists that they listen to. Don't ask me about a lot of the, the pop culture things because I don't understand it. And it's okay if they can tease me about that. So Zach, keep telling your dad jokes. They're awesome. Well, I, I think the the cool thing about uh, anybody that works on a university campus, um, you are always surrounded by 18 to 22 year olds that are gonna rock the world. They're gonna change the world. And it's just the, the pulse on a college campus is really, to me, always been in, invigorating. But then when you're really, involved with a group that you have 12 to 15 on your team, the discussions you have with them. Um, one of my favorite things about coaching is getting to, you know, take them to coffee or, uh, or your conversations that you have really about what they want to be when they grow up. And um, it's fascinating what a lot of them want to become and do. And that I think, you know, just keeps you 
um, so relevant because we both Lisa and I have our own kids. You have those conversations. But when you get to have them year in and year out with these women and you see them grow from their freshman year to their senior year and, you know, just their their views and their takes and their confidence and you see it grow. It helps you stay young and relevant because you get so energized from the energy that that they give you. And you're so proud of what they're attacking and accomplishing on a daily basis in some of their academic disciplines. So that keeps my mind so young and sharp. Um, but they're, they do, like Lisa, she'll know a little bit more than I think most people in her or our age group about the pop culture and the artists because you're hearing it, right? And they definitely keep us, um, you know, if, we're, if our drip isn't good when it comes to athletics in, anyway, um, they let us know that, you know, we need to up the shoe game or we need to have a, you know, maybe a different, you know, top with the pants. So they definitely help us in that regard, too. <laughs> I'm I'm also curious where does humor fit in? I mean, Coach Bluter, every so often they release videos of you uh, in Halloween costumes, or uh, I think uh, members of the team have said if you weren't a basketball coach, comedian. Uh, what what is the importance of of, of humor and, and having fun uh, in in leadership? Yeah, I don't think you can take yourself too seriously. You know, I think people like self depreciating humor, uh, making fun of yourself. Um, you know, that makes you approachable, right? You know, when you can make fun of yourself, um, I think that, I don't know, it just makes you so much more approach, approachable. But I like to have fun. I, I, I love to have fun. And I think if I can create a fun environment where they're looking forward to coming to work, they're looking forward to coming to practice, right? That, that They're not dreading it. I get to go to practice, not I have to go to practice. If I can create that kind of environment, I'm going to they're going to enjoy it. I'm going to enjoy it. They're going to want to come back. They're going to want to work harder. So, um, yes, I love a good joke. I love to have fun. If something happens in practice that's funny, we are all going to take a minute and celebrate it and laugh about it. And I think that sometimes us as leaders, we don't take time to celebrate. We move on to the next thing so quickly. It's like, okay, that was great, but let's. What's the next objective? What's it? I think taking time to celebrate is really important. Um, not so much time that you don't get back to business, but yes, a little bit of time. Um, but yeah, I, I like to have fun in practice and, uh, I will be dressing up for Halloween again this year, Zach. I will not spoil and ask. <laughs> um, I, I'm, I'm also curious, uh, mentors, uh, coach Bluter, you mentioned Dr. Grant, but you know, who's helped you develop as leaders and, you know, is there a lesson or a moment that stands out where, Maybe it took you a while to learn the lesson uh, that that you know, or or appreciate the guidance that had been given. Without doubt, Dr. Grant has been my biggest mentor. Um, before I came to Iowa, um, you know, I would look at other women's basketball coaches like Pat Summit or Vivian Stringer, um, my high school coach uh, Sue Kuderna, who when I was at Linmar High School was there. Um, she was a role model to me and a mentor to towards me. Um, I think it's really important to have mentors. Um, you know, right now, um, I, I, I have more mentors that are probably in the business field than the coaching field, um, because I feel like I can learn from them in operating a business. I mean, this is a business. It's Yes, it's entertainment, but it is definitely a a large business that we're running here at, at I women's basketball. So I feel like I can learn a lot more from uh, speaking to people and, and learning from other people in the business uh, environment. So, um, but Dr. Grant, without doubt, really helped me with my vision of what I wanted women's basketball to be here at Iowa and helped me to understand how to advocate, um, how to hold people accountable um, and just how to how to look at the room a little bit differently and make sure that women were represented in that room and that women were being heard in that room. And she really helped me with that. And so I want to be persistent in, in her vision for our program. <clears throat> yeah, I think uh, certainly Dr. Grant was for so many. Um, but I kind of, you know, Lisa was the head coach working with her, but we were together with a lot of those meetings and conversations. 
But, um, you know, I'm fortunate because I have worked so many years with my mentor, which has been Lisa, especially when I was a young coach and climbing and, you know, thinking I was going to take some of those earlier head jobs. Um, so that's been interesting. That doesn't always happen. Um, and then there's a point then too, when the mentor and the mentee, then you get a little bit, you know, closer and you don't always challenge your, your mentor. Right. And then she also, it's been more closer where she's challenges me and, you know, pushes me. So that's been a really, really cool personal part of this journey is, um, you know, you know, Lisa's just, you know, a hall of famer in every regard. So to be able to work with her and have that, um, you know, just that upbringing, if you will, in the work sense. Um, I had some really great high school teachers and coaches, and um, I had a VP at Drake. He was in charge, or he was the vice president of student affairs, and um, his name was Don Adams, and still alive. Great, great guy. All the Drake and Des Moines people that might be listening, you'll they'll know exactly how much he means to so many. Uh, but way back in the other life, that's what I was going to be. I, was, I wasn't even going to do this coaching gig. I was going to come back and get my master's and then my doctorate and work to be a president of a small liberal arts college. But then whatever, how many years you say? 35 years later, I wake up and here we are. <laughs> and it wouldn't change a thing. Well, I am curious. I mean, you've had the opportunities to to be a head coach other places and, and you haven't left. Is that mm -hmm. something you still want to aspire to? Um, yeah, I, down the yeah, road? I mean, yeah, I think um, you always leave everything open, right? All those opportunities. Uh, but I think it's, uh, you know, it's always complicated because you have so many people that have such a strong opinion on what you should or shouldn't do. And I've heard that many times over um, throughout my my career. Um, is it depends on how you really define success in your own mind. And if success is, you know, for some people, you gotta, you have to be the, the GM, you have to be the president, you have to be the, the head coach. They've always, they early in my career, they kind of questioned, right. But so much goes into those decisions personally. And, you know, I just always had a really, you know, had a high, um, I think just knowledge base of what made me happy. And I know the value I bring to this organization. And I, I know that the dreams we came over with together, Lisa and I, which she has shared, we wanted to go to a final four and we really wanted to try to get this place rocking, you know, with, you know, get the crowds. And so that was always in the back of our, our minds. And um, I never needed, um, that, you know, that head coach placard to make me feel, you know, part of these rings, um, these championships. To me, it's so much more. And I think when you chase the money and you chase the titles, um, it can be a little lonely place. You can eventually get there. Um, a lot of people in coaching, right? They go from this mid-major to that mid-major, have success, go to a low power five, have success, get their big job at a power five. And then now they're exactly where they want to be. That's one route. You know, but the thing about life and living, there's so many routes to be successful, to get to maybe where you want to go. And I think you got to find the path that's right for you. And my path, I'm a native Iowan. My spouse, her family is about an hour away from here. My parents, um, they're no longer with us, but they were on the Western side. And so all of that came into play. And then, man, this team that we had, the players I've gotten to coach who I get to work with. So I've been really blessed. Um, those opportunities, all those crossword roads, um, they make you think, they make you soul search. And when you land, you land a better, more confident person. And um, I think all of that has come to play and has given me a really a wonderful opportunity, a wonderful life. And, you know, I get to work with my best friends and, uh, you know, we're still, we're still rocking and rolling. And as Lisa said, now the weather holds, we get a, are you kidding me? We get a coach together in, in a football stadium in front of all these people. Had you had told me that when I was a young, a young one coaching with Lisa, I, I don't think we ever would have believed that, would we, Lisa? I, I wanted to, to ask about that. Obviously, you have the crossover at Kinnick and watching the weather forecast and hoping it's outdoors. Uh, what is uh, some people would 
feel that that's noise or you don't need to do that or it's added distraction from the preparation you're embracing this I i'm curious why well it was our idea so we better embrace it right <laughs> i mean you know I, honestly um i think the more like the, the more distractions i can create when it isn't as important is really good for us for when we get to the NCAA tournament and then it's win or go home and all these other distractions are happening we're more prepared for them because we're handling these type of situations beforehand. But I also believe this is something for us to do something really special for our program, for the children's hospital, which I've understand we've raised about a quarter of a million dollars for the children's hospital, because all the proceeds will be going to the children's hospital. <clears throat> also bringing national attention to our great university. I mean, this is something that has never been done before. Um, a women's basketball game in front of 50,000 people. The, lo the largest group that has ever watched a women's basketball game is 29,000, and that was indoors at a Final Four. This is an exhibition game in a football stadium. Never did, been done before. Why not create history? You know, why not make Iowa women's basketball something that people around the United States are talking about and saying, wow, they did it. Why can't we? Um, I think it's just a wonderful publicity and we'll be the first women's basketball game that is televised because it is on the Big Ten Network um, nationally this year. So we're going to kick off this year uh, Iowa women's basketball. What a great way to start this season with our team creating national news. And, and I think what's so great about that is you talked about Lisa and the, the, the fun, you know, the Halloween costumes, the I mean, the vision, right? You also want a visionary leader, right? So she comes to me after the final four about a week and she's like, hey, um, I want to talk to you about an idea I had. I'm like, oh, okay. So she's like, well, I thought that we could play a game at Kinnick. And I said, what? She's like, wouldn't it be great? And her mind's going and it's just like, absolutely. And then you get, you know, Beth on board or AD. But the for all the reasons that she says, right, is always thinking how to bring joy to your own team, do something cool, but also bring something new and electric to our great community. And a lot of people, you know, they can't buy the season tickets. Well, now it's sold out, right? But a lot of times it's hard for people to come to a regular season game. But if you put it on a weekend in the fall, uh, maybe someone from Northwest Iowa is going to come down and just be part of that, that history. So it's, it's not a gimmick. It's just a way to, to capitalize on the fun, right? And I think so often we can get so like, oh my gosh, this team, we got to get to the final four. We got to be serious. This isn't, this is a fun part of the journey. And every year, as Lisa said, you know, uh, you know, she, in our, our media day a couple of weeks ago, you know, I, I thought she so beautifully said, she probably doesn't remember she said it, but you know, what we get motivated about and the reason why I stay working with Lisa is everyday growth in our young women is the, the how good they can get as a player, but what they're going to do with their lives and being hopefully a positive part of that. Right. And that's what we focus on every day and every year you try to make this particular group the very best that it can be. And if it gets to the final four, it is mind blowingly cool. But you know, as a coach, you know, if you get them there, but to have this opportunity and then have an experience over there like that, I mean, her vision is just really, really cool and fun. And I, I so hope the weather can hold because I think everybody who's part of it is just going to be a blast. It's going to be stories for sure. So, yeah. well, Coach There's Bluter, the yes, well, yes, it looks good right now. So let's, let's hope that <laughs> it's accurate this time. So, well, Coach Bluter, Coach Jensen, thank you so much for your time this morning. Um, it's a great way to kick off Iowa Ideas. Uh, we appreciate your time, and thank you for everything that you're doing, both as coaches and in developing uh, players and uh, young women and uh, leaders uh, in, in Iowa. So I uh, appreciate your time this morning. Uh, it's now time for the Session 1 block that starts for 1010. Uh, remember, our social media hashtag is Iowa Ideas 23 with the pound signed in front of it. Uh, and we'll return uh, together in the group uh, for our afternoon keynote, Francis Haugen, um, the Facebook whistleblower at 3.30 this afternoon. Have a great day, everybody.